Chapter seven, uh, we're gonna go over head and neck anatomy. Your objectives for this chapter are to list and identify the landmarks of the face and oral cavity. It's very important to understand this uh, no matter what branch of dentistry you're doing. Whether it's anywhere from pediatric dentistry to forensic dentistry to oral surgery. Um, list and identify the bones of the cranium and face. Identify the parts of the temporomandibular joint, which we call the TMJ. List and identify the muscles of mastication, facial expression, and the floor of the mouth. So here we have the um, cranium, and you're going to need to know this for your midterm exam. So we're going to start with the top left and go around so that you can hear how I pronounce them. Okay, let's start with the frontal, sphenoid, ethmoid, nasal, lacrimal, maxilla, mandible, zygomatic, occipital, and parietal. And then right there in the center, you can't really see it, it says temporal. But um, you'll be able to see it when you pull this up on a, on a bigger screen on your laptop. Here we have uh, the muscles of the face and um, highlighted you see orbicularis oris. And that one is nicknamed the kissing muscle because that's what helps your lips kind of pucker up. So that round muscle um, that you see around the lips, that's what that does. It helps in chewing. All of these are muscles of mastication and facial expression. And so you have the buccinator, orbicularis oris, the mentalis, uh, zyga, the zygomatis ma major, um, zygomatis minor, um, medigilis, uh, resorius, platysma, depressor, angli, oris, depressor, labi, and furious. And so all of these things work together and it's not something that you have to know like every little detail about it, but it helps to understand it. So when you're sitting chair side and they say, my muscles hurt when I chew. Well, you can explain to them that you have muscles in your face that help you chew. It's called muscles of mastication. And so a lot of times if you're chewing a steak, has anybody ever experienced where you're chewing a steak and all of a sudden it's like your muscles hurt and you don't feel like chewing anymore? Oh my God, every time. Every time. So these are things that are good to know. Well, what muscle is that? And so that is your masseter muscle and your muscles of mastication help you chew, but they can get fatigued. And so um, sometimes when that happens, you can tell your patient, let's go to a softer diet for a while, maybe take an anti-inflammatory, but the, the dentist will go over that with them. But I want you to be under, understanding what the dentist is talking about, okay? Um, here you have the landmarks of the face and oral cavity, uh, labial tubercle, labial commissor, vermilion border, labiomental groove, vermilion zone, nasolabial groove, and then at the very top you'll see philtrum. So <clears throat> where that would be important to know is when maybe you have a child come in that's been um, diagnosed with fetal alcohol syndrome and when you hear the dentist say we have an indistinct philtrum it's not detailed it's not distinct and so they'll have that flattened upper lip um, and so when they're describing this stuff there's a reason that you need to know the names of this okay or the vermilion zone um, and if they have a cold sore or herpes or anything like that, you might have to document where it is on the face and then measure it. How big is it? Has it gotten bigger over the last year? Um, has it changed in color? You know, different things that you might have to document and chart. I always found this to be interesting. When you look at 
ever since you were in elementary school, you learn about the earth, how you have the crust, the mantle, and the core, right? Look how, look how similar it is. You have the enamel, the dentin, and the pulp. The enamel is the hard surface. The dentin is a little bit softer, like the soil. Um, and then the pulp is the liquid part, the nerves, um, blood, and tissue that makes up the center. And so if you correlate it to the earth, um, the design is absolutely perfect. And so um, just remember the crust is the hard part, the mantle's um, the softer part, and then you get to the liquid part. It's exactly how a tooth is made up. Now we're moving on to uh, things that would be really good to point out in an exam for either uh, cleaning or orthodontics. So you have your hard palate and then you have your soft palate. It's good to know where the soft palate is because if you're working in the molar area or you're taking an impression, don't hit that. It, it can cause a gag reflex. You have the inside of the cheek, the area behind the lower second molar, typically you don't have your third molars, that's your retromolar area. Then you have your gums, your lower lip, your tongue, your tonsil, your uvula, is that hangy ball thing. Um, I used to get a kick out of watching um, Bugs Bunny and they go la 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 and you see their uvula. Anybody remember that episode? Am I dating myself? Um, the upper lip, the underside of the tongue. See where it's pointing to that lingual frenum. We call that the underside of the tongue. Um, that is sometimes when you take that lower impression, get the patient to lift their tongue to the, the hard palate and you can get a really good impression of that muscle. And then you have the floor of the mouth. Here we have the teeth, we've gone over this before. You start with uh, tooth number one, which would be the right wisdom tooth. So that's your third molar. And then you have your second molar, your first molar, your premolars, your canine, your lateral, your two central incisors, your other lateral incisor, your canine, your first and second premolar, and your first, second, and third molar. Then we're gonna look at um, the tooth section of a molar. A lot of people think when, and even some adults have told me this, they think their tooth is just one solid piece of calcium. They have no idea that there's layers to it. They have no idea the center is liquid um, and that we call that the heart of the tooth. So when you're looking at this, you see the crown of the tooth, we call it the clinical crown because we can see it with our eyes. If you want to see the entire tooth, the anatomical tooth, you'd have to take an x-ray, okay? Then you have the neck of the tooth and then the root of the tooth. Then we switch over to the other side and it's a little more detailed. You have the enamel, the pulp cavity, the gum, the cementum, the dentin, the bone, the nerve, and the blood vessels. And you can see where they go up through the very bottom of the root. We call that the apex. Okay, that's not listed on here, but that's what it's called. And so you have circulation through your tooth. And this is what it looks like up close. And so you can imagine how difficult it might be to do a root canal and clean out all of these um, pulp chambers that are branched out and sometimes we'll end up having three separate ones to that one big trunk. Then we kind of break it down to, you have the lingual side, which is closest to the tongue the outer side near the cheek, the buccal, the labial area, and the facial area. The mesial, closest to the midline, distal, furthest away from the midline, and then you see on the lingual, distal, and lingual mesial. Okay, 
Um, and then this is just kind of covering directional references. And they're listed to one through 16. And of course, for the lower, we drop down to 17 and continue around to 32. Now, if you're gonna chart, then um, you would need this in either a paper chart, which most people have gotten away from, or um, software like Dentrix or Oasis, Dolphin, lots of different ones out there now. But this is what you're looking at. And so um, the importance of this is to let us know if it's just an occlusal restoration, um, mesial, distal, buccal, lingual. Uh, and so this comes very handy for remembering what restoration you've done on your patient, but also for insurance purposes, to be able to let them know, you know, if you're doing a filling and it's only one surface, let's say each surface is $100. Well, if you do a mesio, occluso, distal, that's three surfaces. And so that would be $300. So as far as charging the patient, handling insurance, this charting is very important for you to do. All right, root canal treatment. Um, you see here, you have in the first picture, um, the decay, you gain access by drilling through it, cleaning out all of the decay, opening it up, and then you go to the endodontic file to clean out the heart of the tooth, which is the pulp. Um, and so then you would clean it out, uh, add your gutta percha, your post, and then cement your new crown on top of that. Um, one of the things I wanna point out, because we're gonna be going through splint therapy and um, root canal therapy and pain treatment. A lot of patients will have where they'll get their temporary crown for after a root canal. Then they'll come back a week later and get their permanent crown. During that week, they will say, I'm having a lot of pain in that tooth. Well, what's happened is you have cleaned out the um, pulp chambers and now gas builds up. And just like your tummy hurts when gas builds up, there's only one way to relieve it, okay? So either by passing gas or belching, you'll have to get rid of that gas that's building up and causing pain. In your tooth, you tell your patient when they come in and you take that temporary crown off and open up those canals, that gas is released and instantly that pain goes away. So that's what it is. Um, and so letting your patients know that ahead of time is an explanation. If you don't tell them and then they call you, they think you're giving them an excuse. Yes, ma'am. Um, what are like root canals like caused by? So the reason you would need a root canal is because um, the tooth has had decay in the enamel, and it's gone through the dentin, and it's kept going until it reaches the pulp. Once it reaches the pulp, the tooth is dead. You know, so you've gotta clean that out so you don't get infection. And so there, it's not, you know, what, what is the cause of a root canal, it's what's causing you to have to have a root canal. And so that's, that's what that is. So, I always tell people go to the dentist every six months because if you don't and you wait till there's pain, you're not gonna feel pain in your enamel. You're not gonna feel, feel pain in your dentin. It's when it reaches the nerves, blood, and tissue of the pulp, that's when you're gonna have that pain sensation. And then that's when it's too late. You either pull the tooth and get an implant, pull the tooth and get um, a bridge or um, get a root canal or just pull the tooth and do nothing but then the sides the teeth on the either side of where you get the extraction are going to dump in and it's going to cause a different set of problems so um, one of the great things to prevent that 
is when you're um, when you have kids in your practice is to get them to get sealants. So the pits and fissures are mainly where cavities happen with children. Um, because they're eating starbursts, now and later skittles, those things, when they go into these pits and fissures, it gets stuck and they're not good brushers. Um, and you're never gonna see a kid floss, you know. Um, and there are some parents that have the attitude of, well, their baby teeth are gonna lose them anyway. Well, the problem is underneath that baby tooth is a permanent tooth. And if this baby tooth is infected with decay, it can actually go down and infect the top of the permanent tooth that's gonna erupt one day. So having them get the sealant, you're drilling out those deep pits and fissures and then filling it with this composite, this liquidy composite called sealant. And it's gonna preserve that tooth from getting a cavity. The problem comes when um, the dentist don't check it or the assistant rushes through it and you're not cleaning the tooth really well and you're not doing the sealant properly and you leave areas where food can get under the sealant and bacteria can get under that sealant. And now you don't even see the decay until it's too late. You know, you have to see it with the x-ray or when the patient says this tooth is bothering me. So when you're doing a sealant, which we will learn here in class, um, it's very important to make sure that a lot of detail and isolation happens to keep that tooth very dry and make sure they get sealed 100%. And this is just for fun. Uh, if you don't floss, you miss cleaning 35% of your tooth surface. Flossing once a day can increase your life expectancy by six years. And an elephant's tooth can weigh over six pounds. How about that? <laughs> Any questions? No? All right.